reversible and irreversible cell injury. To be or not to be. The fate of a cell rests in the type of injury it encounters. A cell may adapt or fall prey to the injury. Reversible injury is damage from which a cell can recover completely if the injurious agent is eliminated, if it persists for a long time or increases in intensity, the cell reaches a point of no return and dies. This is called irreversible injury. What would you do if you had a machine that could predict the future? If we knew how to identify this point of no return, could we not intervene and prevent a cell from dying? That's exactly what we are going to talk about. If we need to rescue a cell, we need to recognize the signs of distress. They may be ultra-structural, microscopic, or changes in gross morphology. Let's start with reversible injury. The changes seen in the cell are cellular swelling and fatty change. Cellular swelling is the literal bloating of a cell. But why does this occur? The ion transporters in the membranes of the cells and organelles become dysfunctional and let the water in. As a result, organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria swell and the cell itself swells and this is reflected in the overall size, appearance and weight of the organ. The cells develop cytoplasmic vacuoles which represent pinched off segments of the endoplasmic reticulum like tiny bubbles in the cell. Hence this pattern of non-lethal damage is also called hydropic change or vacuolar degeneration. Phospholipids from the damaged membranes aggregate in clumps within the cytoplasm and are called myelin figures as they resemble myelin sheath of nerves. The cell membrane shows blebbing and loss of microvilli with dark eosinophilic cytoplasm due to the loss of RNA. This is a picture of normal intact renal tubular epithelium. The picture on the right shows the same cells with features of reversible injury, namely dense eosinophilic cytoplasm cellular swelling and blebbing. Another telltale sign of reversible injury is fatty change or steatosis. As the name suggests, it is simply the accumulation of fat in a cell. The most common organ affected is the liver as it plays an important role in lipid metabolism. However, it can also be seen in the heart, skeletal muscle, kidney, and other organs. The causes can vary from toxins, protein, malnutrition, obesity, and diabetes mellitus, the most common being alcohol. The fat accumulates in the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte in the form of small or large vacuoles, thereby displacing the nucleus to the periphery. When the majority of hepatocytes are affected, it reflects in the overall increase in size and weight of the organ. The liver looks pale yellow, boggy and greasy. We will be discussing this concept in further sessions. All these changes can be reversed if the injurious agent is withdrawn from the environment. If not, the cell reaches a point of no return and dies. Functional loss is followed by cell death. Ultrastructural and microscopic changes appear before gross features of death in the organ. Now let's learn some more about cell death. There are two modes, namely necrosis and apoptosis. Necrosis is cell death that occurs due to severe injury like ischemia, infection, trauma or toxins. It is always pathological and uncontrolled. The cell dies with the breakdown of all the membranes and release of all its contents into the environment, eliciting inflammation. Specific nuclear changes seen in necrosis are pycnosis 
or nuclear shrinkage, karyorexis or nuclear fragmentation, and karyolysis or digestion of the DNA. This is a picture of normal intact renal tubular epithelium. The picture on the right shows necrosed cells with disruption of the cell membrane, intense eosinophilia of cytoplasm, nuclear loss, pycnosis, and leakage of contents. It's like being at a crime scene of a messy murder. Apoptosis, on the other hand, can either be physiological or pathological. In the previous sessions, we spoke about how cell injury, adaptations, and death are an ongoing lifelong process. The cell death in this context is apoptosis. For example, the shedding of unwanted or aged skin cells and the monthly shedding of the endometrial lining are all physiological examples of apoptosis. In contrast to necrosis, apoptosis is planned, programmed, regulated, and unfortunately also termed as suicidal cell death. It isn't messy, but is a clean freak and leaves no trace of surrounding inflammation. So what decides if a cell undergoes necrosis or apoptosis in pathological conditions? If the damaging stimulus is severe, it leads to necrosis. If the damage is mild but causes enough DNA or protein damage, there are triggers at the genetic level that modify molecular pathways and destine the cell for apoptosis. We will be talking about these concepts in detail in our further sessions. Pop quiz Infections are associated with cell death via two other unusual pathways. The first one is necrotosis, which shows features of both necrosis and apoptosis. It involves not only molecular signaling pathways, but also inflammation. Maybe like an actual murder, but staged to be a suicide? The second one is pyrotosis, where apoptosis is triggered by the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. The word pyro is Greek for fire. Pyrotosis is apoptosis associated with fever. Have you ever been so frustrated that you felt your brain would turn to mush? Well, it's time to relax and meditate. Because believe it or not, a brain can liquefy. Stay tuned to our next session on necrosis. We hope you had fun learning with us.